All right. I am sitting with the chicks on the right. We got Miriam Weaver, uh, also known as Mock, and we got Amy Jo Clark, also known as Daisy. I got to ask, where where does Mock and Daisy <laughs> come from? Oh, my God. You go first, Mary. <laughs> um, okay. So back in the, in b before times, many, many years ago, I had like a pop culture celebrity mockery website that I had with some friends and I wanted to have a moniker to use on that website at the time. And I asked my husband for help and I, I said, you know, here's what the site's going to be about. We're just going to be making fun of just random people and things. What should I be called? And he said, how about Macarena? Like, cause so, so he took the song and he made it like mocking about mocking. And the site was called at the time, the mock doc. So that's kind of how it came to be. And it just stuck and never left. Oh, I yeah. love it. I love it. <laughs> and then we, when, you, we, when we started our site, cause we, um, we started our site in 20, 2009. And, um, I just, we knew that we were going to get lots of crap for being conservative. And we wanted to have monikers because we knew we could not use our real names. And so she was using mock and I was like, I got to come up with something. I have a tattoo of a Daisy. So I was like, I'll just be Daisy. That's easy enough. So, I mean, I, it should be a better story than that. <laughs> it's just, there's not a better story. That's it. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. And you guys were formerly on the radio. How long ago was that? Because, you know, that is let's call it quote unquote mainstream media, essentially, does your exit of radio have anything to do with you two being conservative? Did you have to like have a coming out and leave radio? No, no. just the opposite. Actually, we were we were hired to do radio after the success of our website, which we started in to actually we're almost at our 15 year anniversary. So it started in mm -hmm. February of, 20, of 2009. And then we had uh, an explosive sort of amount of publicity after we were um, temporarily blocked on Facebook. We were trailblazers of being banned on a social media platform. And because of the publicity from that, we had our local radio station. We were both living in Indianapolis at the time. And our local radio station reached out to us and said, would you guys be interested in doing radio? We had never even considered it. And all of a sudden we were like, yeah, let's do this. And it was because of our conservatism that we got that gig. Yeah. Okay. So it's not formally on the radio. You guys are still on the radio. No. Yeah, well, we well, we actually we started our we had a radio show at WIBC in Indianapolis for almost eight years. And then I left to pursue something else because I kind of wanted to I wanted to move to Texas. I wanted to go back into the corporate world, which is a temporary lapse of judgment on my part. <laughs> um, and then and it was probably a good thing. I feel like everything is divine. Everything that we've ever done as friends or just us becoming friends was divine. Um, very serendipitous how we met and everything. But when I got out, I got out for about a year. Um, and in that time, like th probably we've been doing our podcast for three years. So about two years, no, a year before I left, maybe a year before I left, a year before I left radio, we had started our podcast that we were doing simultaneously with the radio show. And it was doing Okay. I mean, it was just like, it was sort of an afterthought. I hate to even say that, but it was just something that we did for fun on the side. And then it wasn't until we started doing like regular everyday videos for people on Facebook that it started taking off. And so we, we put that together with our podcast. And then after I left radio, um, you know, it was one of those things where we were like, okay, well now the podcast is taking off after I left and then I was like, well, screw this corporate thing. I don't really want to do this. <laughs> and then I convinced Mock to leave. Well, I didn't, it wasn't the only reason, but I was like, come on, you should just totally leave radio. And then, you know, she was thinking about doing that anyway. And there were all sorts of the, the vaccine mandates and all that stuff going on at the time. And so um, it just, everything came together and it all worked out perfectly. And like I said, it was just super serendipitous and it was meant to be. And the podcast I think is, is fantastic for both of us because we have the flexibility I'm able to live in a different, we, we can live in different states, you know, we can, we don't have to be in the same geographical location. Technology is a beautiful thing. And plus it's, there's freedom. We can say whatever the hell we want yeah. you know, about what we want. There's no restrictions on how we say things, what we say. There's nobody breathing down our neck really about that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and you have a little bit of that in radio. You can't say, you know, tits on, on the radio. <laughs> Which she oh, said, you, you, can, you, you can, you can, but you'll get fine. <laughs> right. And we will learn that very quickly. I thought it'd be me that would say all the bad words, but Mock is the one. Gosh, she used to get us in so much trouble. 
on the radio. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going to have to have a meeting with my team and uh, the producers of this program to see if we're okay with tits. Uh, we may edit it out, but. Uh... <laughs> you can't, so, we can. <laughs> so, so look, no, we're about as real and raw as it gets. Uh, you know, independent media is the way to go nowadays, yeah. especially if you are on the right uh, mm -hmm. for multiple factors and reasons. But I want to know about your guys' awakening. Uh, so, you know, our brand is Awaken Winning, and we often talk about really what Awake is, because I think it's important to define these things. I often still have a lot of people say that I'm woke. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. okay, we got to define <laughs> these things because I'm the opposite of woke. But awake really means that you're aware of the lies that most of society is indoctrinated into, right? Um, whether it be with all different kinds of sectors of our world, uh, government, uh, mainstream media, you know, marketing, corporations, school system, pharmaceutical companies, and just the establishment in general. I want to know about your guys' stories. When did you wake up? And have you always been on the right? Is this like since since your childhood? Uh, what is the stories there? Mary, you go ahead, Mary. Um, well, so I would say I was fair, like through college, I would say I was pretty disengaged from politics, from the world around me, from all of it. I was just sort of living life and not paying attention to the big picture. Um, and, and that so was a couple I years ago or <laughs> yes, totally. Awesome. See what okay. you did there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I would say it wasn't until in, in terms of our awakening, and, and I'm defining it a little bit differently than you are, because for me being um, awoken, is that the word? Is that even, am I conjugating correctly? Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, that means that I started paying attention to things that are bigger than myself and what impacts the whole culture. So you, you go through your younger years, a lot of times, mm -hmm. or at least I did, where you go through like a selfish phase where you're only concerned about what impacts you directly. And it wasn't until until the summer of 2008, when Obama came into the picture and all of these people started being so wildly inspired by him, that's what engaged both of us in politics. And so right. that was a different kind of awakening. That was sort of a, that was one awakening where we became engaged in the world and not just our immediate local circles. But but being um, awakened in the in the way that you're describing it, like knowing that we've been lied to about a lot of things that has taken a long time for me, I think, because I am a trusting person by nature. And so to me, it was the covid thing that really was like the explosive. Holy crap. They they don't care about us and they really do want to control us and they really do want power over us. That was a real wake up call, a real wake up call for me. Yeah. And I, and just to like compound that, cause I mean the same stuff, cause we started our site, same thing, you know, 2008, we both were kind of disengaged. And for me, it was kids, kids got, got me really interested when I had, you know, I took on stepkids. I started giving a crap about things that were going on around me politically. And that's when we became, or I became more politically engaged is because of kids. Cause I was like, how are we going to leave this world to our kids? You know, everything is so borked as, as Mary would say. And so, and it's, and listen, we've become increasingly borked over the past 15 years, even though we've been fighting and fighting, fighting for our kids. So kids were a big consideration for me. And then I, you know, I had my two step kids and then I ended up having my own biological um, child. And so everything is, has been centered, I think around my kids and what kind of world we're going to leave for them. So that's one, but the, for me after COVID and, and during COVID really too, um, I was just asleep to the medical industry and I thought, oh, doctors know what's best, right? Doctors, I trust doctors <laughs> and then, oh my, and I worked in pharma for like 20 years in the wow. court. I worked in pharma and my husband worked in pharma. And so, I mean, I, so I saw it on the other side. And so now, and I've gone through some, you know, health stuff and I, autoimmune things and I feel like now I don't even want to go to the hospital. I don't want to get sick. I have such a, um, I have this sense of, I just want to make sure that I always stay super healthy. I take such personal responsibility for my health and my well being, And it's important that I do that. It's important that my family does that. I mean, for a lot of reasons, you know, for the trust reasons, but also because 
of how they're dumbing down medical school. And, you know, just, I go to the doctor and I'm terrified by some of these doctors, not all of them, because some of them are great and they're in it for the right reasons, but some of them are just, they're, <laughs> some of them are just toddlers <laughs> and, they just, and they're so wokeified that I don't, um, I don't, I can't rely on them to, to have, to know that they have my health and well being in their best interest. I have to take responsibility for that. And I have to be the advocate for my own health and my, my well being. And, and so COVID was part of it, but then there's just been like 15 years, 10, 15 years of me coming to that awakening. So that I think the medical industry and the public health, that's a huge thing. I think we both have been through. Yeah, I still think the biggest conspiracy of COVID was to turn all of us into conservatives, or at least yeah. the ones who had their their eyes open. You know, we had this really good run where it was easy to trust the establishment. And it was very easy to even say, you know what, I'm not even going to vote, you know, because I used to say that I'm not even going to vote, you know, who, whoever is in power, it doesn't matter, it's not going to affect my life. And then all of a sudden, something like COVID happens. And now all of a sudden, these governmental decisions that the people at the top are making highly affect not just our day to day lifestyles, but the way in which we make money uh and literally all of our daily formalities and you know and then that opened up a whole can of worms for i think a lot of people to you know really go down the rabbit hole of like really questioning everything that the everything. establishment does and mm -hmm. i think some people did and i think those people woke up and now i think those people have a very difficult time trusting the establishment i think uh very evidently there's a lot of people who didn't take the time to question I think that's in human nature. I think it's very difficult to question, um, you know, what is the status quo? Because if you start to question it and you start to see lies, well, now it's very difficult to speak out and to have to go against the grain. And it, in many ways, uh, aligns with what's ancestrally consistent, which would have just been great for survival, would to just be follow the tribe, fall in line, follow yeah. whoever is the speaker you know, uh, up there who's telling us, you know, how we should live our lives. And um, it's it's very difficult to go against the grain. So I really want to ask you guys about um, speaking out and standing up and saying no. Um, this is something that some people cannot still to this day, some conservatives can still not to this day bring themselves to do. Has it always been easy for you to to speak out and uh you know stand up against the government say no um not comply uh and you know tell us a little bit about what that was like uh for you guys if it's just always been easy or and and what happened when you actually did start speaking out i i think it's probably been easier for me than it has been for miriam i don't know because i'm I'm one of those, um, against the grain kind of people. Like I just, it's in my nature to be, um, to, I, I don't want to, how do I put that? A contrarian? It's a, yes. It's in my nature to be that way. I don't like being, I don't like fitting in, I guess. I'm not really that sort of a person. I, I like being, um, different, I guess. I, I'm like, I want to be different. I don't want to be like everybody else. And so I think I've always just sort of gravitated to be that way. So I'd like, and I'm a risk taker. And so I'm, I'm okay with the risk involved with, um, going against the grain. Whereas I think the risk taking part of it has probably been a little bit harder for her because she is so nice and agreeable. At least you were when we first started. <laughs> it's, it's funny, Daisy, um, yeah. you know, before mock goes, I want to really just, I was actually going to go there. I was going to say there's a psychological trait that they measure called agreeableness. And I was going to ask, are you just high, uh, sorry, very low in agreeableness and mock, are you, do you consider yourself maybe higher on the ag agreeableness scale? Um, do you want to answer first? You go, you go ahead. You answer that. I'm, I'm curious because I, I don't want to answer for you. Well, and I think I've even taken the test that you're referring to. And yes, I am very much an agreeable person. But as far as speaking out, it's, it's become, I feel like it's become easier and easier and easier 
uh, the longer we do this. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I think we become actually more and more intolerant of people who won't do the same. Yeah. So, cause we'll get so many emails from people going, I would only say this to you. Don't publicize my name. And I, you know, I, I have all of this to tell you, but don't, don't say this on the air. Right. It's that kind of, and we are just like, Oh, do, you can't let this rest with us. You have to speak out because this mm -hmm. is a this impacts you and your communities. It's not just about one person anymore. It's about all of us. And so it's become much, much easier to be outspoken on those issues. And then, you know, it's one of the reasons, you know, Daisy, as she said, left radio uh, initially to do like a corporate thing for a while. I stayed in radio and did a show with this other guy for a year and during that year was when all the COVID restrictions, all the mandates were happening. And it got to the point where my, our radio station was saying, like, I already complied with taking a, the one dose Johnson and Johnson, which I was so mad about. I was so mad that I complied. Um, but I did that. And I was like, never again, I'm not doing this again. I don't care how many boosters they require. When the company said we're going to require boosters, that was another decision maker for me because I was like, I'm not doing I'm not doing that. I, I'm done. Like I've I did what you said the first time around. I regret it. I'm not doing it again. And so that led to that decision. So I think I've become less agreeable, um, particularly when it is about the future of our country, which, of course, we care deeply about. Yeah. And I and I would, you know, and, and just. I would get so pissed off. Like when we would, we've talked to say like Riley Gaines, you know, and I, the people that I get most mad at are to, to her point are people like the parents of all of the swimmers who didn't speak up. I'm like, we're, I, nobody ever talks about that. I'm like, what about all of the parents of all the swim? Like, she's so great. Right. Cause she's speaking out. Everybody talks about her and that's great. But what about all these other swimmers in the light of that whole debacle that they have parents who said nothing. Where the hell are these people? Like that's the thing. So all these people are silent because why? Because they're afraid of people saying to them, Oh my God, you're not telling the lie. Like you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose this. You're going to lose that. Who freaking cares? Like people, if we don't, ever, if we don't speak up for what we actually believe in, are you really living an authentic life? Like what is wrong with you? Grab some balls. So I was just, <laughs> Or if you have tits, maybe use those. Because right, right? not everyone has balls. Right, maybe. Right? Maybe. And if you do have balls, make sure you sun them. Sun them. Right? On a nice them. sunny day, right? And that will hormonally have benefits as well, too. Look, right. I, so, you know, what we also don't talk about is the tail end of what you said there. Um, I'm going to get to the societal impact that speaking out has. But I think the greatest contribution that an individual can have to the world to make it a better place is to make themselves uh, and, and to make them the greatest possible version that they can be. Now, you mentioned authenticity. When it comes to, and this is something we don't talk about enough when it comes to speaking out, we talk about the societal uh, implications but we don't talk about the implications that it has on you internally. Look, you are not giving yourself a fighting chance to live your highest quality of life. If you are led down the path of living a lie and you are not able to rest your head on your pillow at the end of the night and reflect back on your day and be like, you know what? I expressed who I am to my core and what I believe in. And mm -hmm. I believe that that has an incredible weight that just weighs so heavily on you consistently as you go about your day to day life. And therefore, you're not um, fulfilling the biggest contribution that you can have to the world. Now, then it goes to something that I fundamentally reject. People come up to me all the time. You know, I'll go to like a, a hockey game, for example, or I'll go to a restaurant and someone will recognize me. And look, I am going to sound critical uh, at, at this point, because I think maybe that's the only way to really wake people up in this regard is to, you know, people come up to me and they say, you're so courageous, like same thing. I get people saying like, we need you. Like I've even been called a hero, which I fundamentally reject as well too, for just saying what I believe and standing mm -hmm. up and saying no and speaking what I believe to be the truth. And people will say, you're so courageous. You're a hero please don't like tell anyone like I just I, I look from afar I can't speak up because of xyz mm -hmm. and it's like well not only do you for your highest quality of life and potential need to be able to speak up and say what you believe in and express your authenticity because that's your greatest contribution to not only just the world but also 
to your family, mm -hmm. right, as well too. But I think it's our duty here on earth to, to speak out. And why is it easier now to speak out than it was before? I believe it's because it's a little more, we're desensitized to it. There's been more people that have stood up and spoke out. And what that does is, again, we have this like herd mentality. We have this, you know, wiring, I believe that like, you know, we're in danger if we don't fall in line. And now mm -hmm. the line's getting blurry because there's more people like us. And my message is just always like, we need as many people to speak up about this as we possibly can, because I think more people not just are awake, but have the potential to wake up to all these things. And I do think it's getting better. But my message is like, if you are still in the dark, you know, tolerable steps, you don't have to go out on Instagram and make a video and or or sit in your corporate, you know, lunchroom or boardroom or wherever you're at and and speak out. Maybe it just starts with like challenging Auntie Sally a little bit at Thanksgiving dinner when she says that like, you know, uh, we, we have to get back into mass because did you hear like, you know, the new variant of COVID and it's like maybe <laughs> speaking up a little bit or pushing back on that. And then you get desensitized to it. It is a skill, right? It doesn't yeah. happen overnight. It's not a light switch that you can just turn on and go zero to a hundred, but you got to practice these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to, I can't wait for it to, to trickle into culture more into corporate America more because you know, when she was in that last year radio and I was in corporate, that corporate, awful corporate job for like, what was it? Nine months. And then I was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, I, cause I'm a born entrepreneur and I'm going to stab myself in the face. Um, <laughs> I like, like, I, I just remember watching a lot of the guys who I worked for, who were like in the C-suite of this company. And a lot of them were conservative people, but they were unwilling to, to be conservative out loud in their, in their day-to-day -day corporate lives. Whereas if they were liberal, they would, you know what I mean? They would be just fine with it because that's accepted in society. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I I'm, I'm waiting for the day when it's like, it's going to be okay to be like right wing or conservative or have more conservative principles out loud in public where people don't feel like they're going to be demonized. I just thought, wow, what a bunch of wusses where they can't live their lives out loud because for fear of being canceled, or I don't know what exactly their fears were because I'm not in their brains, but I wish we could see more of people living authentically as I guess, I don't even want to, I hate saying right wingers, but just as conservative people in corporate America, in culture, in pop culture, like in, you know, when we see people on television and stuff like that, you just don't see it as much. And that, when's that going to happen? I want to see well, that happen. It, look, I, I do want to say it, it often roots, there's, I think, multiple factors, but it often roots in money. And here's another message I have, because a lot of people say they can't speak up because like, I don't want to lose my job. And look, yeah. that is something that I'm compassionate to, empathetic to. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine, you know, you got mouths to feed, little mouths to feed. You got right. your kids, you got your you know, wife, you got to support or husband, whatever it is. And if it comes down to money, that is a scary thing. But I think you guys are a great example, as am I that I was scared shitless to make my first video about speaking out about the COVID bullshit. And I was uh, terrified because I was a coach online. And I thought, well, if I go against the grain and people hate me because of the way I think, then maybe I'll lose business. Maybe I'll lose money. Right. So what I think is a great message is to say, hey, you don't understand the opportunities when you go against the grain. Sure, you might lose your job. And that'll probably be the biggest you know, uh, blessing in disguise ever. Because I mean, look at you guys, you went from I mean, Look, radio, you had a bit of a different story. I actually thought you guys moved away from radio because of your conservatism. So it was kind of reversed there. But let's just say it was the other way. I mean, you guys are having so much more success with your podcasting. I mean, my platform blew up. I mean, I certainly am not speaking out so that I can make more money, but it's a really nice, convenient side effect that my <laughs> business is thriving more than ever because I yeah. speak up. Because guess what? There's a huge market out there that wants to hear it. Totally. Yeah, there well, are a lot it, of people. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too, that it does. You know, I hope that you're right when you say 
there's more and more voices like ours coming into the to the fray because I think to your point that people you know have been afraid of being canceled and there's been tremendous pressure on companies to be woke and what's amazing is that the pressure has come from such a tiny minority of the country in our case in the United States and I and I do think that most people have a lot more common sense and they reject a lot of the wokeness that is being pushed on a lot of these companies. But for whatever reason, the CEOs have been like, oh, God, I got to say all the right stuff. Exactly. Or I'm gonna get... And I and I'm just like, you don't have to look at Dana White and the UFC. Yes. I mean, that's what we need to see so much more of, because and I hope that people recognize you can have an a tremendously successful operation and say whatever the hell you want and be okay. You, in fact, you'll be, you'll be welcomed for it. You'll be like, it'll be, it'll be welcomed by everybody when you do it. Cause man, was that refreshing to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People applaud it. A lot of us yeah. will stand up and applaud it and be like, Oh my God, yes. that's refreshing. <laughs> oh Dana, my God. Dana White is so hot right now. And right? I, I just, I love listening to that guy and the NBA, the NFL, the NHL and the MLB should take notes and look, yeah. go yes. woke, go woke, go broke. Yeah. Has so much validity to that statement because the UFC is thriving. And I think yeah. they exemplify how big of a market there is for that. And sure, they're like kind of more the hyper masculine, you know, and look, if you look at hyper masculines, if you look at the data, like the vast majority of them are conservatives. So like, you know, there probably is some, you know, obviously a, a alignment there that maybe isn't in the other four major sports, but yeah, take notes because like, at the end of the day, I also think that the the majority of the people don't really not only care, they actually want freedom of speech. They want to have differing opinions and beliefs spoken. I think it's just that small minority of people who are very loud and then yes. people get afraid. Yes, mm -hmm. that's exactly yeah. Yeah. right. And they've had such a stranglehold on culture, on politics, on education. It's It's really terrifying how powerful that tiny minority has been. Exactly. Speak to me about something I talk a lot about, which is rejection, criticism, judgment, abandonment, and shame. When you are on the right or you go against the grain, you have a counter narrative ideology or belief system or worldview, and you speak out about it, you know, you, you have to have thick skin. You really do because you get those five things. Talk to me about your guys' experience with that. Have you guys lost friends? Like, Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So t t talk to us about how you've what what's happened there and then how have you dealt with those things i well I, the very first when we first started in 2009 that's the very first thing that happened to me was a a dear friend to somebody who i really really loved um her name is tammy she's like right off the bat she's a, a liberal she was like we can't be friends anymore because you started the site the site the site called chicks on the right i'm like wait what we've been friends for years like what are you talking about like we we weren't even on the radio we weren't doing we hadn't written a book we hadn't done we weren't really even successful then we hadn't made any money doing this but she was like well you're you're doing this i feel like you probably will be successful with it at some point but even if you aren't i can't be associated with you at this point and i was like wow that sucks. Okay. So I, at that point I learned, um, that a lot of liberals aren't as tolerant and compassionate and, um, you know, loving as they, they say they are, they claim to be. And so that was a wake up call for me. Which and, is and their we, mantra is to right. is tolerance. All they're, all they're really looking for is tolerance, inclusivity, diversity. And that's not just, I mean, that should bleed into diversity of thought and yeah. ideology and beliefs, but apparently it really doesn't. It's so, I, I, I just ask for consistency. That's what I get really fed up with. It's like, mm -hmm. just, just be consistent. And you're not, you're not consistent on so many different things. And it does seem to not to sound tribal. And I'm like you, I don't like to, to acknowledge too much about our separateness because i think we need to actually talk more about being on team fucking human right. instead <laughs> of just always with the totally woke great. ideology of like consistently mm -hmm. uh you know really affirming our differences right and i think there's a big agenda there and the reason why wokeness is is so powerful but yeah it's like tolerance what what, what happened to that
Yeah. Well, and, and I think too, there's, you know, um, because we've obviously faced all kinds of attacks. I mean, ever since oh we God. got started doing this, it's been nonstop. And so you do develop a thick skin. I think at first it was like, oh my God, I can't believe people are saying mean things to me. And then we were like, the older you get, you're like, you have no fucks left to give about right. the criticism. And then, you know, there was, there were, for a long period of time, I was, I thought, I'm, if you're going to criticize me, I am going to monetize it. And so we would, we would write, we would share all of these ridiculous ridiculous, you know, emails that we would get on what we called the wall of shame. And I thought, and, and I thought this is the perfect way to just sort of get back, get even and feel like you're, you're, you're not sinking to their level. You're just using their hatred in a positive way. Yeah. And so I, that's been one way that we have handled it. I think that has been a lot of fun. It's a beautiful way. <laughs> yeah. She does it in a very beautiful way. I will say though, that it's, it's weird because we're old enough to remember when, liberals and conservatives could sit down and hang out and shoot the shit and not get so bunged up and be like, we can't be friends anymore. I'm going to flip the table over because you think this way. And I think that we j people could just hang out and have philosophical differences about political things and not hate one another. And now it is completely different. I mean, 20, 25 years ago, things were really different in America because, you know, we didn't hate each other so much. It is a different place to live now. And I don't, and I don't think there's any turning back. You know, if we go even deeper with it as well, too, I mentioned those five, they're essentially things that uh, humans are very afraid of. Because again, if we look at ancestrally, it's like if we had rejection, criticism, judgment, if we were abandoned, if we were shamed, it was very dangerous. We were thrown to the wolves, right? And I, th I still think that wiring is within us. But I think a lot of us have wounds when it comes to that, you know, like, every, a lot of us have stories of getting bullied when we were a kid or like getting rejected by, you know, your crush when you were in elementary or mm -hmm. like, you know, your dad abandoned you like we all kind of have a story of like one of those things or insecurities that we feel shameful about. Look, right. the only way to heal a wound is to face it, right? Because you're actually not what you're doing when you heal those things is you're building your capacity to be with them. And what, like, I'm, t it sounds so silly, but m my Instagram and my podcast and my social media, it has healed my wounds, my insecurities. It has built my confidence more than anything. And I, it sounds silly because it's Instagram, but when you expose yourself to those things and you build your capacity to actually be with them and get hated on, I don't know. There's anything that builds more self-confidence than that. Yeah. I think I, our, I think our community has done that in a lot of ways, at least for me, it has, because, um, you know, I always used to feel like, God, there's something missing. There's something missing in my twenties and thirties or something missing. And then when we started our company, we started, you know, when I became best friends with her, that actually filled a little bit of a hole. And then, um, you know, and then I became a mom and that was like personally very fulfilling. But then when we started chicks on the right, it was, you know, I was like, I don't know where this is going to go. We didn't have a freaking business plan. We didn't, we weren't those, <laughs> we we're still not don't. those, <laughs> we still don't. And we were not those people where we're like, let's sit down and do it. What are we going to be in 10 years? Can I, we're just not those people. We okay. Always, you're that person. I am a but, little bit. I you have to bit, deal with me. <laughs> right. I'm a little bit more of that person. I'd love to maybe try to do that, but we just, it, but I, but I have her as a best friend. So it's a, it's a little different, but, it, Sorry. but we, but we've, <laughs> I still love you, but we, <laughs> but it's just really, it's interesting because we have this, we've built this amazing community of people and that is what we've always been most proud of. And it is really crazy how they've helped I'm, I won't speak for Miriam, but they've helped heal me in a lot of ways because, you know, I did have kind of a crap. I did, had some crappy family stuff growing up. Miriam had the perfect family. I did not. <laughs> and so, but there are a lot of, but when you have bad days, there are people who are there to support you. When you need something, they can fill that void. I mean, there it's what we've built. It's like having a baby together, this business. Mm. And so we've raised this baby, this baby. I look at this baby and I'm like, God, this baby is amazing. It's smart. It's like intuitive. It's, 
I mean, it's gorgeous. Like this baby is a, I can't believe we created this, you know? <laughs> and so it's a really cool baby that's grown up to be a wonderful, like teenager, I guess it's in its teenage phase at this point. Cause it's 15. But I mean that I think we're most proud of the fact that it is a community of these amazing people that we never dreamed we would be hanging out with on a daily basis. And so that's been probably the biggest healing thing for me is just yeah. being surrounded by them. And, and you, you should be so proud. You both should be, um, you know, and I wouldn't go out of my way to say this, but you know, I, I admire what you are, you two are doing so much and it's so needed, especially as, as females, right? Because I mean, you guys aren't supposed to be conservatives, right? Like, yeah. come on, is, you no. guys have been, you guys have been oppressed for so long and you should be sh hitting True. the streets and screaming that nonstop and, Lady you know, parts. attaching to that and <laughs> yeah, making it your identity and getting indoctrinated into the woke culture, because mm -hmm. then you can just fall in line and everything will be easier. True. But I, you know, I, um, look, I think it's a superpower. I, and again, a message for people listening, because I, and I know this is probably hard to hear because we're being very bullish on, yo, just get some balls or some tits and speak out right. about all the bullshit going on. And some people mm -hmm. are still in that, even people listening are still in that, you know, fearful state. And, and, uh, you know, I, I get it. I get the fear, but hopefully you understand our message of why it will not just, not just be a good thing for society, but be the best thing that you ever do. You know, I, for your life, for your highest quality of life, I posted something the other day, I'm getting more active on threads, um, you know, cause I think it's a good way to think out loud and, and test and, and test ideas and see what people like. And I made this post recently about United airlines because they're saying their number one priority for 2024 is diversity and hiring. Right. And, you know, I look, when I am flying in a metal tube at 35,000 <laughs> feet in the air, I don't really care about how diverse the fucking staff is. I want you to right. hire the most qualified people for the job to get me to my destination safely. So mm -hmm. I made a post about that and it got on threads that actually got shared. And by the way, this is one example. I deal with this on a daily basis, self-inflicted. I'm not complaining. I'm not a victim by any means. But I just, it got shared a lot and I'm like, oh, it actually got a lot of comments on threads, you know, more than it normally does. So I'm going through the comments and there's hundreds of comments of people just calling me a racist and a bigot and like, you don't oh understand, you're God. a fucking clown, blah, blah, blah. But you know what the most beautiful thing about it was? Is I did not even, and I can't say this about every time, I did not feel one ounce of being triggered. My heart rate did not elevate one ounce and I was reading personal attack like they were going deep and just they were ruth ruthless and savage but for me to be able to scroll and i it hasn't always been this way like yeah. i take it took me a long time to get there but i was scrolling and i actually just thought it was entertaining there was almost a part <laughs> of me that liked it and embraced mm -hmm. it fully and that to me is a fucking superpower because if i can do that i can go out into this world and when you can go out in this world and you can handle Again, rejection, criticism, judgment, abandonment, and shame. I mean, w it's a superpower. It is. Yeah. It really is. It, now, it's like, take that. It, I want to be able to do that because I think we're both there. It took us a couple of years to get there too. But it's like, once you can do that, and then if I can somehow bottle that feeling and then teach my young girl how to do that, God, that'd be great. Because man, that would be a great superpower to have in middle school. Yes. Middle so school is the worst. Middle oh, school yeah. girls are the worst, Kayla. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, so talk, talk to us, uh, let, let's go to, um, you were two females doing a podcast. This is achieving something in the external world. It takes a lot of work. You guys, I don't know if you're okay with me labeling you guys as, you know, you guys are hus like you hustle. I don't know if it feels that way, but we you hustle, hustle, you go yeah. out, you make shit happen. Notes to the grindstone, blah, blah, blah. But you're also conservative, right? So like, I'm assuming that you do believe there's a difference between men and women and like, yeah. you know, yes. the crazy idea that is, right? So crazy. <laughs> but talk to us about, you know, maybe just the, I want to, I think this episode has flowed so nicely to, we've talked about the awake part. Now let's talk about the winning part, right? So how do you guys win as females who you guys have the same daily formalities that everyone else has? Plus you got kids. I, I actually... I don't know for sure, but I think you guys are both married. Like you guys got lots going on. You got a business, like you speak out, you probably do a lot of research. Like, how do you 
juggle all of these things and 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 be on the path of winning as well i i for me it it goes back to the authenticity thing i think it's always remaining true to myself and i'm not going to get it right every day and you just have to be um um humble and then you if you mess up you just say oh, i messed up on that and that and then just do the best you can and i you know and also from an authenticity standpoint like one of the things that i think mary and i both do is um we we do things like we age normally and we don't try to be other people. And we're always, you know, like people along the way have tried to make us something that we're not like in our 15 year tenure as chicks on the right. We've had PR people say, hey, try to do this and try to do that. We've never taken that advice. We've always just been true to ourselves. We're best friends. We just chat about stuff every day. We've just always had our formula, our special sauce, if you will. And we've remained true to that and authentic. And I think authenticity is just like the most important thing when it comes to doing what we do. And I think that, you know, is also a, a good thing to do personally too, is just to be authentic in everything and in, in, in your personal life and your professional life and, and everything. And then I think you win. Well, and, and I would say I 100% agree with all of that. And then just from a personal standpoint, I think winning to me personally, I, I mean, I know you asked like, how do you juggle it all? And some days I have no idea. <laughs> I genuinely have no idea how we juggle it all, but we do. And I think winning though, to me, like if you just get down to the nits and nats of it, to me, a winning life means that I have loved and been loved and that I have felt more joy than heartache and that I have given people joy. And right. so, and then beyond that, like, just, I feel like if you have, if you have contentment with who you are and what you're doing day to day, that to me is a huge win, but that's how I define winning. Mm -hmm. Man, there's so many ways to de define winning. One of the ways in which I define it is how you feel about yourself when you're by yourself. And yes. I give credit to Tom Bilyeu, who says that a lot. And I think he's the originator of that concept. You know, and some people say, but no, it's about love and connection. And well, yeah, all of the above, like all of that is factored into at the end of the day, how are you going to feel about yourself when you're by yourself? Right. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I think for me coming out and, and speaking out about all these things and like truly living at least through my content. And then also I really pay a lot of attention of how I'm showing up outside of social media and everything like that. Um, you know, I've come so far in being able to just express who I truly am to my core. And that makes me feel really good about myself when I'm by myself, you know? So I think that really is winning. Um, I want to ask about conflict resolution. Look, I, I have worked with a lot of people over the years. I've built businesses and, you know, we have a team and uh, I've partnered with, you know, people I'm, I'm in other businesses as partners and advisors. And I, I work, I've had very difficult, many, many difficult conversations also been in relationships. I just know that, and you even alluded to how not alluded, you outright said, this is like a baby uh, that you guys have. I know that you guys don't see eye to eye all the time. I know you guys <laughs> butt heads and I know you guys irk each other and piss each other off. So how do you guys approach? What is the framework if you have one or just how do you approach and what is your strategy with conflict resolution? With and each other? You guys aren't You're talking about yeah, with, with each other? With each other. Yeah. We mud wrestle. Obviously, mm. okay. we totally we get it's 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 mud wrestling, right, Mary? Now, is I there usually a crowd? I usually can you sell tickets. Her. <laughs> we we usually put it on YouTube, and then I can obviously overpower her, Gaylor. This Hello. is your number one revenue stream. Now I'm Hello. now I'm learning how you guys make money. The only reason we make money is because of that. It's bikini mud wrestling. Hello, that's right. That's exactly right. But it is. <laughs> I mean, I well, don't know. I would say, I mean, that that is true. Everything she said is true, of course. But I would say happily in 15 years, I think our conflicts have been really all, minimal. All like, resolved. I, I totally agree. I mean, well, we, and resolved because we talk. We don't. If, right. if she's mad at me, she's going to tell me. You I know do. what I mean? I do. And I, I want do. to be told like I there's nothing I don't there's nothing that makes me crazier than like having someone be mad at me and not and me not knowing why or not, not understanding why there's a rift. So she will tell me and that I have, you know, I, that's, that's, we just talk it out. Like we I do. think there's, if you don't communicate with each other, that's terrible. And I think that we actually do that really well. And I think we're just, we, we don't agree on everything, but we're also very simpatico. So like, it's, 
our conflicts have been very minimal, I think, for a 15-minute relation- relationship. Very, right. It's like a marriage. I think marriage is break down if you don't communicate. Mm-hmm. And she's my life wife. And I feel like I'm her life wife. And so yeah. we're, it's one of those things where if we, if there's a, I do, if I, I'm like that with everybody, if I have a problem with you, I'm going to tell you I have a problem with you. Miriam is so, she's so agreeable. Like, <laughs> I feel like I probably pissed her off more than she leads on, but she probably <laughs> is like, God, Amy was a total bitch today, but she's not going to say it. You know, she's just <laughs> one of those people. And then she's just like, I'll get over it. And then she's fine the next day. I'm sure I've done that a million times. I'm the kind of person that if I have a problem, I'm like, I have a problem. And then, and then she'll be like, okay, what's the problem? And let's solve it. Yo, you have a problem. Let's <laughs> solve it. And we do. And then we solve it and we solve it right then and there. And then it's over. And then we're like, okay, let's go shopping. You know, <laughs> like that's how we do it. And that's why we've always <laughs> been best friends because we've just been honest with each other. And there's just nothing that is off limits. And, and she's the best. And we're, yeah we were meant to be best friends and it was, and then was, I can call her and, and like, tell her all the things. I mean, in right. all the things. So totally. like, I'll be like, I need to talk to you about my vagina. Right. And she'll be like, and I'm like I, I want to hear all about, tell it. me all about your vagina. That's, and that's, <laughs> that's what we do. This is how okay. we do what we do. So now the uh, appropriate and inevitable segue is, is your vagina. <laughs> Let's now talk about that. Um, no, do you, so we don't sun I just it. hope it gets a lot of we sun. Not, I, we have no. not sunned it. Okay, we have well, not sunned our concerned. vaginas, Kayla. Now I'm no. concerned. Now I'm no. concerned. Okay. <laughs> um, that's for part two of this episode. <laughs> right. But look, I echo you on the communication. Communication is the fundamental principle of any healthy relationship, whether mm-hmm. it be a business partnership, whether it be any any kind of intimate, romantic, right. uh, interpersonal, just the list goes on. But to take it even a step further, what I find incredibly important about conflict resolution is a, a couple of things, you know, number one, uh, the ability to not, not just, you know, it's not enough to say not take anything personally, because like, look, I'm not going to sit here and say, I am a highly conscious individual that's done a lot of work, but I'm not going to sit here and say, I don't take anything personally. But what I will say is I have the ability to become aware of when I'm taking something personally and communicate that and even say, Hey, when you say this, here's what comes up in me. When you say this, here's the story I tell myself in my head. Or when you say this, here's my thought process. I don't know if that's objectively true. This is how my body is instinctively reacting. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's to go into what data are you going, like what evidence are you going off of? Like, what's your framework? Help me understand. So then it goes into curiosity. So it's like, instead of just projecting and saying, I'm angry, this is bullshit. I don't like you when you do this and and just really project. It's to then say, I'm curious how you got to that. What's the evidence? What's the data that you're going off of, right? And how did you get to that conclusion? Now, I know some people might say like, Kayler, it's it, your your communication sounds like you're in a board meeting or something like that. It sounds very corporate and stuff. Sure, it maybe doesn't have to be that polished, but you have to be willing to not just communicate, but also go into the depths of that. Because I do, and I have noticed that some communication can be actually unproductive if it's just two people projecting their inner insecurities and egos onto each other. Mm-hmm. So. Right, listen, we both we both have been married twice we've seen, we've been in some relationships. And so I think it's like, you kind of know when you're best friends with somebody too, that if they're angry, usually it's like anger is, is hurt masquerading as anger. You know what I mean? And so you look at them, you're like, why are they hurting right now? I'm going to try to figure out like, why are they hurting? Let's make sure that they don't hurt. And you, when you love somebody, whether it's a a spouse or a best friend or whoever, you don't want that person to hurt. So you're trying to, you try to figure out what am I going to do to make sure that person doesn't hurt? You know, and Wait, so you're yeah. conservative and you have tolerance. This is like, I just don't get <laughs> I have it. empathy. <gasps> don't tell anybody. Kayler. Yeah. Like <laughs> right. I did, I did not know that chicks on the right had empathy. It's just like, I thought it was just all about like, life is hard, get a helmet and just go out and make money and <laughs> well, the government, fuck too. the government. I yeah, mean, of we're all those things too. A little <laughs> and, bit of that too. And you know what? I'm sorry. We're getting soft. And I really do. And even in my industry, you know, I'm a coach and sure I, I get it. You know, trauma is a real thing. I'm all about it. I'm all about wounding and I get the nervous system dysregulation. Like I, I get all that, but 
let's not take it to an extreme that I think it's getting to. We're getting to yeah. a point where we're just so fucking soft. And sometimes oh it God. is about just pulling up your fucking bootstraps, yes. looking yourself in the mirror and saying, I don't need to feel sorry for myself right now. I'm not a victim. I actually hold the keys and the power and I can go out and change my life like I couldn't have even ever imagined if I just do what's required. And guess what? You can show up and do what's required while you're crying. Yeah. And you can show up and do what's required while you're having a bad day, right? You yeah. don't need to sit on the couch and sulk and eat the ice cream like most therapists are telling people nowadays, mm -hmm. you know? It's yeah. like, and I'm all about feeling the feelings. You got to feel it to heal it. I get it. Journal, all the things. But men, we also just need to go and get to fucking work and yeah. watch yes. your life get better and better and better. You're talking to Gen Xers. We know. We That's cry right. through a lot of shit. I ain't talking <laughs> to you guys. I'm, I promise um, for that one. No. Okay. Let's, as we wrap up here, I want to like, what's, what's going to happen? I mean, look, I am Canadian, um, but I am you got way your own more problems. immersed. Oh my God. Well, you we, do. Right now, right? we do. But I got to be honest, I'm just as immersed into American politics as as Canadian politics, because, you know, the impact that it has just on a global level is huge yeah. and also on us. And yeah. sure, we definitely have our own problems, but what's going to happen? And I know it's such a low loaded question. What do you, what do you think the future looks like? And let's not zoom out like 20 years. Let's just talk about like two years from now. Like, are we going to make it through this volatility that we got coming on? Do you have any predictions about the election? And are you guys more so optimistic pessimistic what's what's the thought process oh god i you know it's I, if you would have asked this question two years ago i would have said i would be the pessimistic one and she would be the optimist but i feel like we flip-flopped i feel like i'm trying to be the optimist i try i'm like i'm gonna be the, uh, the I'm, <laughs> love and light yeah love and America, light. let's do this and she has really become the pessimist because i don't think i mean am i saying that correctly mary I'm, yeah for sure i'm i'm an optimist by nature but i mm -hmm. and i don't want to feel pessimistic about the upcoming election but i right. do yeah. Yeah. Cause I, 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 the general scares us both a little bit and I'm trying so hard to go, we're going to, we got this, we got like, surely people in our country cannot be that stupid where they're <laughs> going to vote for Biden again, if it's a Biden Trump matchup, you know, but I, but, Oh God, there's a lot of stupid people in our country. And Look, Trump is me. not a great choice. And I he's mean, not the best. And it's two old dudes. It's two old freaking dudes going. And that's the thing. And we're a little worried about that. But listen, I, you know, we'll both vote for Trump if he's the guy. And, and you know, we'll see what happens. It's like a roll of the dice at this point. It's I just don't really know if I'm happy about the rematch. T tell me about what you think about this prediction. And I would put a decent amount of money on this. I think that Biden is going to drop out. I, I think he most definitely been, is going to drop out. Yeah, we've been saying voluntarily, that too. Voluntarily? Voluntarily? We no, think I it'll think be by he's force. A, no, he's we, a puppet. Yeah. yeah, I think he's getting set down and just being like, yo, like we can't have Trump because they think he's the existential so threat. So who, who do you so, think will be put in there? Newsom. We do too. That's what and we think too. And I think Newsom beats Trump. Yeah. I, I oh, I mean, easily. without question, without so that's, question. That's what I think is going to happen. And that's my fear. And mm -hmm. look, would I rather Newsom than Biden? Now, I got to preface this with people are going to think that I'm like pro Newsom here, not one bit, but I genuinely would rather Newsom than Biden. But he's the lesser of two evils. And I fear just with, you know, honestly, just with mostly the like, of course, the economy but uh and other issues like oh my god uh, he's a nut job <laughs> he is but i worry about foreign policy i worry about uh, the wars and everything mm -hmm. like that like you know i think trump the good thing about trump and I, I think i'm on the same page with you look i i actually like trump i don't like every aspect of him what i'm not really wanting is just the polarization and just the the it's like you know what what happens when you don't give a kid a candy bar and they they have a hissy fit like that's that's what's going to happen if trump trump gets uh voted in and there's going to be a, just a lot of volatility just civilly and like th yeah. there's going to be protests and people and then we're going to be yeah. more divided than we already even are at this yeah, point even mm -hmm. though i think trump's policies are way leaps and bounds superior totally. to biden's but yeah. they don't see that it's all about emotion for them oh, yeah. so here's my fear is um I think Trump is 
kind of a wartime president, I, I think people genuinely fear. And when I say people, I mean, like world leaders, I think they genuinely fear Trump. I think China hesitates on, you know, or even stops uh, in terms of invading Taiwan. I think Trump would go in and I honestly think he would go to the table and negotiate with Putin and end the Ukraine thing. And uh, and with, uh, you know, what's his name? Um, from Ukraine, I'm drawing a blank. Zelensky. Zelensky. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think he he even goes to the table with the Israel Palestine thing. And I honestly think he creates a lot of peace with these very, very scary proxy wars that could elevate to to a hot war or a really intense economic war. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And he proved that the first time around, there was more peace in the Middle East than ever with new yeah. peace treaties among countries that had never taken part. So, I mean, especially if he has Jared Kushner you know, helping coordinate and negotiate on on his behalf in that way. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it he is the better choice between two terrible choices. Yeah, but I do yeah. agree with you on the Gavin Newsom thing. I agree with you. I, we, we've been saying that for a long time now, that they're probably just going to slip him in past the goalie last minute. They're not going to do it in the Democratic way, even though they scream about democracy all the time. They're going to slip him in there, and Kamala will be like, well, that's fine. I'll just continue <laughs> to be vice president could, could and then you imagine right. if Cam like if biden actually does run and then he wins and then kamala you uh, know, oh my he God. has to drop out because of how like i could not even imagine like that's when i get really scared like personally yeah. but you know what He's here's the thing idiot. the Dem the democrats i get frustrated with because they just stand at the podium and they call putin a dictator they 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 call out hamas and they they call out kim jong-un and they, they call out china and all these things and trump's a businessman like n none of these people have created any business in their life right on the on the left right so trump knows that the number one thing you want to do is be a negotiator the the number mm -hmm. one like uh priority when you're a president is to stop world war three from happening and you got to be a deal maker you got to negotiate and trump knows that you got to pick up the phone you got to be willing to sit at the table and not just stand behind a screen and say how bad of a human they are right so exactly you know it it's man so you got to get shit done. He knows, he, yeah, he knows how to get shit done. He knows yeah. how to do it and he's willing to do it. And he's not going to be like eating ice cream and, and sleeping in a like basement, which is exactly, know, yeah, exactly I, what Biden's done. I know we have to go, but who's Trump going to pick as his VP? I think it's going to be Christy Noam. What do you think, Mott? Mm. I don't know, man. I mean, there's so many choices at this point. Mm -hmm. It could be Christy. It could be Vivek. Um, I would be fine, by the way, with either of those choices. Me too. I, I don't want him to pick somebody that's too much like him. So like a Carrie Lake, I think would be a disastrous mistake. I think like a Marjorie Taylor Green would be a horrible nope. mistake. Yeah. Um, but somebody like strong, but not crazy. Good. Strong, but not strong, but not exactly like him. He needs somebody that sort of balances him a little so bit. So you know who yeah. would balance him out greatly is Tulsi Gabbard. Yes. I, she would be good. She'd yes. be really good. And she would also pull on a lot of independence. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I think Tulsi Gabbard would be an unbelievable pick. I yeah, she's cool. also like Vivek, but I think he just announced that it's not going to be Vivek, unfortunately. Really? Oh, yeah. okay. I think I, I heard that, that, but I could be wrong. Oh, my friends, uh, we're going to have to do this again. I love, <laughs> yes. honestly, I love jamming with you guys. With, with all due respect to all of our other guests, we've had some great ones, and but I just really love talking to you too. So We love jamming with you too. <laughs> Let's do it again. Let's, Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Yeah. Yeah. We should. It's so fun. Soon. It's so fun. And I know our audience will love this one. So thank you for being here and giving us your time. I, I would keep going for like a Joe Rogan style episode if we didn't have to leave. <laughs> we love it. Thank you. We hope to yes, talk to you again. Thank you really, so really much. Uh, of course. Tell everyone you can shamelessly plug. What do you want people to do? Where can they find you? Well, we're, uh, we live stream every morning at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on basically every platform. And you can see all of those platforms at our links, uh, which is chicksontheright.com slash links. Amazing. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you.